Welcome friends here on Sunday the 26th of April to First Baptist Church Grand Cayman and from wherever you're joining us we're delighted you're joining us in this way today. This is what the Word of God says in Isaiah chapter 44. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and yet what is to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Is there a God beside me? I know not one. Join us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this, the day that you've made. Help us now as we join with our songs of worship, joined by our choir, to indeed join the strains of heaven's worship of you, the true and the living God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Sometimes we can get a little confused with Bible books. Where are they? Even when somebody says, well, why don't we turn to the book of Hezekiah? And then we feel like an idiot to discover that Hezekiah isn't a book, he was a king. But you'll have no problems, no matter how unfamiliar you are with the Bible, in finding our reading today. For it's taken from the very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. And we're in the first chapter and at the ninth verse. And this is what the word of the Lord says. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Well, welcome, friends. This morning, I want to turn you to a small island. In fact, our theme this morning is Jesus from a small island. And I imagine a number of us are thinking, oh, do you mean Grand Cayman or Little Cayman or even Cayman Brack? No, the island I have in mind is the one we read about earlier in our service from Revelation chapter 1. It's when the Apostle John is on the Isle of Patmos, he tells us, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The Isle of Patmos is about 13 square miles, around the size of Cayman Brack. It's a small island with a population probably around the size of Cayman Brack as well. And today we have, if you like, in the book of Revelation, notes from a small island. What I'd like to do this morning with you as we turn to Revelation chapter 1 is to just dig out some facts that we probably are very familiar with but we need reminding of constantly. John was on the Isle of Patmos not because he was quarantined or in voluntary isolation because he was somehow or other having to face a first century equivalent of COVID-19. He was there, he tells us, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, we do know that the Isle of Patmos was a place where the Roman Empire could regularly banish some of its criminals to. They could sweat out some of their days in the ore mines there. And in all seriousness, it looks like that's precisely why John was there. We have a phrase for prisoners in the United Kingdom, detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. Well, John is detained at his majesty's pleasure. 
He's in a position and in a situation he would, I imagine, never have chosen for himself. How much better to be back with his friends and his family and his church and his ministry in Ephesus. But here he is on this little Aegean island, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. And yet he's there, and while he's there, the Lord Jesus comes and gives us this wonderful, fascinating, and oftentimes for many folk, confusing book of Revelation. So here's John in a situation he would not have chosen for himself, in a place that he probably did not want to be, but it was there the Lord met with and spoke to him. And I suspect many of us today, because of coronavirus, are in different forms of lockdown, quarantine, isolation, banned, as it were, to our homes, maybe finding it difficult living so close to close family, hour upon hour, needing a little bit more of elbow room, perhaps almost feeling because of age and ill health, imprisoned like John almost certainly was. But I want to remind you that it was in that unlikely situation that God met him. And I believe in whatever Patmos you are in today, God wants to meet you as well. You see, the Lord Jesus is never bound by human decisions. He's, he's never in a place where, well, you know, he couldn't possibly visit there. And John is visited by the living Lord. What's happening worldwide at the moment? Well, at one level, you might say, this is God's pressing the pause button on human life and history as we know it. People are already saying things will never be the same again. And this is a time when God has almost said, stop, listen, I have things to say to you that you may not hear otherwise. Some time ago, I read of an American actor, well known, I won't quote him, but he said, I am waiting for the serum that will offer immortality. He wasn't looking for the cure to coronavirus, but just the serum that would give him immortality. Well, I'm so delighted that we have this wonderful book of Revelation because here we find not the serum, but the savior who gives us immortality. And I'm praying today that whatever situation, circumstance, location you may be in, that there by the power of his spirit, Jesus Christ today will visit you afresh and anew. And you'll go on your way rejoicing that despite the Patmos you're in, there God has turned up and met with you. Three big truths I want to bring before us today. And the first is simply this. Let's hear firstly an essential word. Now John knew Jesus perhaps better than almost any other earthly disciple. He was the beloved disciple according to tradition, which I believe. And yet this day when he meets the risen Lord and he'd seen the risen Lord after his resurrection, number of times over 40 days, but now he meets Jesus when he's an old man. And when he gets this vision of Christ, he is totally overwhelmed. He says, I fell at his feet as though dead. And the first thing we read is this. Jesus says, fear not, be not afraid. Isn't that such an encouraging word? Various folk have tried to compute how many times it comes in the Bible. A number of years ago now, listening in on sermon class, one of my first year students when I was principal at Moreland's College, this is what they said while in full flow. There are 365 fear nots or equivalent in the Bible. And a part of me wanted to interrupt them there and then and say, well, it's not enough. Because you see, in my diary, there is a thing called leap year. And in leap year, you don't have 365 days, you have 366. And I can imagine the devil whispering in my ear, Steve Brady, be afraid today. Why? Because it's the 29th of February. No, it isn't. It's, it's the 21st of June or the 13th of September. Ha ha ha. For you, it's the 29th of February. It's Groundhog Day. 
And tomorrow will be the 29th of February and every one of your days from here to eternity is going to be the Groundhog Day of fear, fear, fear. Well, somebody else did the maths or the math, as we like to say, on the American side of uh, reality over here and discovered that there are 366 fear knots or equivalent. I don't know about the arithmetic. I do know about the theology. Jesus says, fear not. What is it you're fearful of today? What is it you're facing? What, what is the problem? Whatever it is, Jesus Christ comes and says, coronavirus, fear not. Wars and rumors of wars, fear not. Old age, losing your job, dysfunctional family, depressed by the circumstances you're in, the Lord Jesus comes and he says, stop being afraid. For when he is there, no matter what we're facing, even death itself, all is ultimately well. So we firstly need to hear this essential word from Christ, fear not. But secondly, let's trust in an eternal Lord. One theologian summarized the Lord Jesus like this. He's the man who fits no formula. <laughs> In other words, where do you categorize Jesus? A good man, great prophet, or something far, far more? Well, in this vision that John gets of the living Lord, the thing we can certainly say is this, that the person whom he sees is definitely human. There's the humanity of Jesus here. In uh, chapter 1 verse 13 we read that he saw one like a son of man. Now that's a loaded title. It was on our Lord's lips in the Gospels. It goes right back to the book of Daniel when a mysterious son of man comes to the throne of God. Whatever it means, and it means far more than simply being human, it doesn't mean less. The Jesus whom Christians love and honor and worship is the true human Jesus. He's one of us. That's what Christmas is about. He joined the human race. He took our flesh and our skin. He lived the kind of life we always ought to have lived. He's a true human being. In fact, he is the only true human being because he was sinless where our sins dehumanize us. But because he's the true human being, that doesn't mean that therefore he's put off by us. He's one of us. He's joined the human race. And because he's one of us, then he understands us from the inside out. As God, he can observe us from a distance, but he's joined a human experience to his life. And that's why when we come to Christ, he always understands. The Bible has a great deal to say about his being a great high priest who, for example, is touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. He's been there. He's seen it. He's done it. He got the T-shirt, we say. He's the Lord who is one of us, his humanity. But there's something else in this passage, and that is very clear here. It's suggested in two or three ways. Not just his humanity, but his deity. For example, in verse 14, we're told his head and his hair were white like wool. And that also reaches back to Daniel chapter 7. And the one whose head and hair are white like wool is none less than the almighty God. And as we draw our breath from that, we're told that he is, verse 18, the living one, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Scripture, is the living God, the living God. And Jesus says, I'm the living one. And specifically, he says, verse 17, I am the first and the last. Echoing those words we read at the beginning of our service, from Isaiah chapter 44, the great Yahweh, the eternal God says, I am the first and I am the last. And Jesus takes that title here because of who he is. In speech, first and last is what we call a merism. 
M-E-R-I-S-M. It's not a well-known word. But a merism is when you put extremities and then you include things in between. So, for example, heaven and earth, east and west, first and last. Jesus Christ is the first and the last. And what does that mean? Well, it means he's got everything in between in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands and he's got you and me brother and you and me sister in his hands and he's got everything in between in the hands of omnipotence, his deity. But then there's a third thing. There's his Calvary. I am he who lives and was dead. The Savior we worship truly died. He went to a cross. Chapter 1, verse 5 talks about his blood, which means sacrificial death. He was the victim. Chapter 5, verse 19 talks about him when chapter 5, verse 9 talks about him as the Lamb of God as the one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when John looks at him in chapter five, he's the lamb and he's the lamb who was slain. And why was he slain? Well, as John the Baptist put it, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There on the cross, Jesus Christ made one great full atonement for sin. The word atonement means at one meant forgiveness with God, welcome. How can that be? Well, because the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose to bear. His heart with sorrow was torn, yet not my will, but yours, he said. This is our God the servant king, he calls us now to follow him. And this one also who was pierced for our transgressions, as Isaiah 53 has it, who's born in his own body our sins, is the victorious Lord. His humanity, his deity, his Calvary, and his victory. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive for ever and ever. He's conquered death. What's my biggest problem? Well, facing the judgment of God. And that's been dealt with in Christ. What's my next biggest problem? The final enemy, death. The statistics on death, as we know from George Bernard Shaw and from human experience, are most impressive. One out of one people die. But Jesus Christ, here's the difference. He, we die, and it seems to be it. He died, and now he lives. And because he lives, then when we trust him, ultimately, we shall never die. He's conquered the grave. He's the risen Lord. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Those of you who are fans of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, you've seen the films, will know all about Gandalf. Gandalf the Grey, the wizard. <laughs> and he has an upper and a downer with the Balrog. And uh, both of them seem to die uh, in the mountains of Moriah. And eventually he comes back. And he's no longer Gandalf the Grey. He's now something more splendid. He's Gandalf the White. The story of a kind of resurrection, correct? Well, yes, of course, but it's only fiction. We don't go around singing, Gandalf loves me, this I know, for the Lord of the Rings tells me so, unless you want to get your head examined. But we do sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and how can he love me if he's dead and gone? Well, the answer is he isn't dead and gone. He's conquered the grave. He's the risen Lord. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive for how long? Ever and ever. Here's the risen Lord in the midst of John's small island, coming to him 
And I pray coming to you and meeting you and speaking to you and transforming despair into hope and that chaos inside to the very peace of God. Third thing, therefore, let's grasp an encouraging hand. We want to listen to an essential word. We want to trust an eternal Lord, but we want to grasp his encouraging hand. I, I love this phrase, he laid his right hand on me, verse 17. Aren't that, isn't that a lovely phrase? His right hand. Of course, the hands of Christ had healed the sick, touched the leper and the outcast, broken bread and fed the hungry, given sight to the blind, and then was stretched out on a cross and pierced for our transgressions. And this right hand of Christ, we're told, holds the seven stars in his hands. It's a mighty hand, it's an almighty hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's the risen Lord. And it's that right hand that John says, he laid his right hand on me and said, do not fear, I have the keys of death and Hades. A lot of us are worried about being around people who are coughing and wheezing. I grew up in a backstreet culture where we used to joke about such things. It's not the cough that carries you off, it's the coffin they carry you off in. <laughs> well, that's encouraging, isn't it? But Jesus says, when it comes to your future, when it comes to your death, I have the keys of death and Hades. I am the one who has the keys of your destiny. Some of you may recall uh, one of my uh, stories from oh, 15 or more years ago, coming home late one night from the university of which we were a part. I was uh, just very close to home. It was a very dark night, a dual carriageway, no artificial lighting. And there in the distance, I saw a, I didn't know what it was, a very slow moving little, little tiny red light. And as I got closer, I realized it was hardly moving. And just, and I swerved out the way and it turned out to be a slow moving, uh, what we call moped. I think if the lady had dangled a carrot in front of that thing, it would have been going faster. And I swerved out the way, lost control, and disappeared into the trees at maybe 40, 50 miles an hour by this time, slowing down, slamming on the brakes and just crying out to the Lord and thinking, this is it. And suddenly I, I hit something and it flipped the car upside down. And remarkably, I landed between two banks of trees with a ditch between them so that the roof of the car and my head stayed on. Wow. And as I emerged, uh, the lady on a scooter moped had stopped and she expletive Jesus Christ. I said to her, excuse me, it's because of him I am still here. I was just speaking to him two minutes ago and he's preserved my life. She thought I'd had a serious whack on the head. I was absolutely fine. Because you see, here's some good news. Trusting Jesus, you can go into every day knowing this. By the grace of God, you and I are going to die on time. Have you got that? By the grace of God, you're going to die on time, in God's time. And that's why it's so important while you're alive that you really live. If you belong to Christ, then since you're gonna die on time because he has the keys of your destiny, nobody else, not coughs and colds and COVID-19, he has the keys of your destiny. I don't know how it all works out, but he does. Then trusting him, I can face the unknown morrow and the challenges of today. As somebody said, when you belong to Christ, you are immortal. So here we're told that Jesus and Jesus alone has the keys of our destiny. We can't go till he's ready for us. Many years ago now, uh, when my family were young, we moved from the east end of London 
to the town we then spent the last 30 years or so in, Bournemouth. And when we arrived, they had a different educational system. And it was then it came to light that my son, who was only nine, was struggling with maths, or again, math, for those of you from North America. But a lady in the church was a math, maths tutor. And she came to me and said, your son is way off the beat with maths. He's far behind. I said, that's right. She said, I can help him. Let him come to me once a week and I will help get him up to speed. Well, to say that he wasn't excited about this arrangement is a mild understatement. But week after week, he'd go along and he'd do the extra maths tuition. And then one day she came to me and she said, your, your son's doing well at maths, isn't he? And I said, well, yeah, he is. She said, do you know why? I said, it must be your excellent tuition. Oh, no, 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 she said. I wish it were as simple as that. The reason is because the workbook he's got has got the answers in the back and he's turned to the answers in the back and just copied them down and he missed one out and he just kept going. If you move them all down one, he got the right answers. But this was his way of coping with the maths. What do you do when your kid's done that? I think I might have taken him out for a celebratory ice cream. Pardon? Well, you see, my kid was smart. He knew that whatever the problem mathematically, arithmetic, geometry, trigonometry, he didn't care because he knew that if he turned to the back of the book, he got the answer to the problem. He learned a lesson that many Christians are yet to learn. They go through life always blubbering about this and that and the other's wrong. If you only turn to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you get the answer. There are many competing empires on the earth today. And some of them are the empires of ill health and fear and frenzy and pandemics and pandemoniums. But Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. And this book shouts back to us across the centuries. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And then that grand crescendo, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. And if you've grasped that, then you can go to chapter 19 and join the hallelujah chorus. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. I don't know about you, I am really grateful for Jesus from this small island. For Jesus, the Lord of the world, coming to your small island and my small heart and finding a welcome there. May God help us and strengthen us as we afresh meet and encounter by faith Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, today. Let me pray with you, if I may. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the great conqueror over sin and death and hell. And we thank you that we know it's true because you've been raised from death and are now alive in the power of a a resurrection life, a, a life that will never come to the end. And thank you for the incredible promise that because you live, one day we shall live also. Help us in all our fear and confusion to trust you, the Lord who has the keys of our destiny, and boldly step out into whatever today and tomorrow and this week and this life may bring, knowing your hand of mercy and grace upon us. We thank you and bless your holy name. Amen.
Well, thank you again, friends, for joining us today. Please feel free to join us daily as we have a thought for the day from First Baptist Church, and we look forward to being in touch in the coming days and weeks too. May God bless you, and may the risen Lord light your path by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.